an entire world is ready for you to start your career teaching the path to wellness. Mastering the science of mindfulness and the art of coaching to help clients achieve mental, emotional, and physical betterment of life through movement, nutrition, recovery, and regeneration. Because impacting one person impacts a family. Impacting a family impacts a community. And impacting a community impacts the world. Become an NASM certified wellness coach. You're listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie. Winner of the Share Care Emmy Award for Social Storytelling and the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the NASM CPT podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and today I want to talk about something that I found to be pretty interesting, and, and it's something that was pivotal, 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 pivotal enough. For us to make changes in our CPT-7 uh, from our CPT-1 through 6. In fact, it's so pivotal that um, many other educated bodies have or will have to change their content. So I'll start with this. It's, it's really about hypertrophy and how many reps do you need to do in order to grow muscles? How many reps does it take for your muscles to grow? And... Um, there's a, there's a really fantastic meta-analysis that has come out that changed everything by, by Brad Schoenfeld. Now, I'm a huge fan of Brad's. I've got the opportunity. He teaches. He's a professor at Lehman College, which is the very, very northern tip of Manhattan. And before the pandemic, I was blessed with the opportunity to speak to some of his students when it comes to uh, and to meet him, which was exciting for me, that's a, that's a, like rock star uh, for for fitness nerds to be able to meet somebody like Brad Schoenfeld. So I went and spoke to his class, and that was great. It's his research that does so much for us to the point that it's changing how we actually provide content now. I'm going to say this. I'm going to I open my textbook and for CPT7, if you've got the textbook, this is on page 620. It is table 20-3, suggested, suggested repetition sets and training intensity. And it's still got the old stuff in it, but it's got a little caveat here. So if you want stabilization endurance, that's 12 to 20 repetitions. Uh, which is equating to about 50 to 70% of your one rep max. Muscle hypertrophy, 6 to 12 repetitions, or 75 to 85% of your one rep max. And then your max strength, 1 to 5 repetitions, or 85 to 100% of your one rep max. So if you want max strength, 1 to 5 reps. If you want muscle hypertrophy, 6 to 12 reps. If you want stabilization and endurance, 12 to 20 reps. Well, it seems that we're not the only ones who have been putting this content together. So uh, this is this is common common practice, common conversation. This is this is um, standard throughout the fitness industry. It's not NASM. NASM doesn't make this stuff up. This is what's out there. It is people like Brad Schoenfeld and the people that he worked with in uh, developing this content and this meta-analysis. So this is where it comes from. The, the latest thing that's been put out, and it's here's the study by Brad Schoenfeld, and then you've got Gurik, uh, Gergic, Van Every, and Plotkin. And those were his fellow authors. The study is called Loading Recommendations for Muscle Strength, Hypertrophy, and Local Endurance, a Reexamination of the Repetition Continuum. And this was put out in the Journal of Sports. Here's uh, a quote pulled from the paper. It says, support for the repetition continuum is derived from the seminal work of De DeLorne, and when I looked this up, I went to that study as well. This study was put out in 1945, and he proposed that high load resistance exercise enhances muscle strength and power, while low resistance exercise provides better muscle uh, endurance, and that these loading zones are incapable of eliciting adaptations achieved by the other. Then subsequent research came out, 
Anderson and Kearney in 1982 and Stone et al. in 1994 all provided in part additional support to Lorraine's, um, uh, Delorme's hypothesis, forming the basis of what is commonly accepted as theory. So NASM is putting stuff out there commonly accepted as theory. This is what we as an industry accept. This is what we, we know from what the studies are that are out there. Well, part of this is this kind of 8 to 12 repetition, 6 to 12 repetition, uh, a hypertrophy zone. The hypertrophy zone, and it's been noted through multiple ed educating bodies. Uh, NASM included. Now, I can't speak for the others, but NASM immediately, once this content really came to light, Schoenfeld's meta-analysis, uh, it shifted from where we were at CPT6 to where we are now at CPT7. So it's still in the textbook. It'll say, you know, stabilization, strength and power. It still says that, but then there's a caveat. And then you read the footnote on this on this um, table here, table 23, 20-3 on page 620, it says muscle hypertrophy adaptations can be attained with various repetition set and intensity schemes, depending on the total volume of the training and the client's fitness level. So shifting, shifting around is taking place. Well, let's look at a little bit of what we're talking about here in this study. In this study, they looked at um, the one to five rep range. And they looked at the six to 12 rep range or six to 15. They looked at the 15 reps plus. And you know what they found? Very, very similar hypertrophic activities. The same similar amounts of muscular development, similar amounts of growth, muscular growth. It didn't matter if it was one to five reps, didn't matter if it was six to 12 reps, didn't matter if it was 15 plus reps. Now, when they got into I, one of the one of the pieces they put out there was like 30% of the one rep max. So not only does it take so long to ever get to the point of fatigue, but that point it did start to show less and less hypertrophy. So they're looking at, I think the, the studies even showed up to 50% of load. And we'll, we will look at another study here, and that's, that's Grogic, uh, and he did a low load versus a high load resistance training muscle hypertrophy, um, muscle fiber hypertrophy meta-analysis, and, and he found that there was no difference in the load, low load versus the high load. Now, uh, the details of that load, we're not looking at something very low, like 30%, but that directly correlates to your repetition range. So when we look at this repetition continuum, we can no longer necessarily say one to five reps is maximal strength, but not hypertrophy. That six to 12 reps is hypertrophy, but nothing else happens. And then we can't say that the 12 to 20 repetitions is muscle endurance and not hypertrophy. It is. In fact, that entire repetition continuum can elicit muscular hypertrophy, muscular growth. So that's why the change has been made. That's why we're looking at what we're looking at here. We're shifting the way we look at the repetition range. Now, not only that, is that we'll put together some other content for you to look at hypertrophy and see where hypertrophy fits in along um, not just loading patterns. Oh, one of the other things that they talk about in the study was majority of the stuff that they, the the content that was studied, the, the data that was pulled in this meta-analysis, majority were untrained individuals. And that would make sense that if you haven't trained at all, then then you would create a hypertrophic response to any new stimulus. But they didn't find that that excluded people that were already resistance trained. They were already uh, established in their resistance training programs, and they still were able to see hypertrophy through different repetition ranges. So it's not just for for new lifters that can see this, but it's actually some seasoned lifters. There doesn't seem to be a difference in response. Now, what does this mean for you as a fitness professional? Well, if you're looking for 
um, the repetition range for hypertrophy, then it's probably what you're already doing, no matter what you're doing. The, is it to fatigue? Is it to you can't lift anymore? And um, the data doesn't seem to actually show that. The data seems to show that as long as you're pushing through effortful lifts within your final repetitions, then you're going to elicit a hypertrophic response. What, what does that mean? It just means that it, it can't just be easy the whole time. You can't do the three pound dumbbells, do 12 repetitions and be like, oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I've reached 12 repetitions. I'm, I'm hypertrophying, but you could have done 6,000 repetitions. That's not the thing. So there does have to be a correlation with the intensity of the lift, the amount of repetitions, and then the effort that goes in towards those final lifts. So what we would usually refer to as volitional fatigue, which is saying uh, volitional, I voluntarily think that I've done enough. <laughs> so that's enough. Let me put that down. And, and so you can put the weight down and benefit from the repetition range, whether it is low or whether it is high. I think that is important to point out. I think it's important for us as fitness professionals to know because this really rocked the boat. This took the theories of what we knew to be true and shattered it. And I want to shout out to NASM for doing this, changing what they say in their content. Now, what they still promote is a progressive exercise program where they may start at higher reps and then move to lower, more intense reps and then lower uh, repetitions, higher intensity. So you might start with that stabilization and then you might move into a strength training that still has that hypertrophic range with six to 12 repetitions and then continue to move until you get to that one to five repetition range. You know why? Because that's progressive overload and that still makes sense. What we're not saying anymore is that you don't worry about hypertrophy. Well, what does that mean for the people who are like, oh, I, I like to do the higher repetitions because I don't want to get too big? The answer is that you could do lower repetitions and still not get too big. Uh, hypertrophy, usually, we don't find that to be an accident. People don't accidentally do too many repetitions and get big. There's a lot that goes into it. Trust me. I know. <laughs> um, it's not, you don't just get big because you lift. There's a lot more that can go into it. You have to have the diet to support it. You have to have the diet to support it. And so are you taking in the amount of protein that you need? Are you getting the amount of rest that you need? Are you focusing on all the other acute variables that hypertro that your body needs in order to hypertrophy? Because if not, you're just lifting and you might just be getting stronger. You might just be building your endurance, but you might not be increasing the size of your skeletal muscle. All right. Uh, I found it interesting. I love this stuff. I have several other topics um, and research on hypertrophy that I want to bring out to you. And this is all sorts of things from how much rest does it, how much rest in between sets? Should you stretch in between sets? A lot of things on hypertrophy that I will be bringing up in future episodes. So thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. Like, subscribe, share with your fitness friends and family. And uh, if you need to reach out to me, you can do so. You want a topic for me to cover. I'm happy to entertain what you've got. Uh, you can hit me up on uh, email at rick.richie at nasm.org or Instagram, DM me at dr.rickrichie. Keep inspiring people to fitness. Thank you for listening. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.